All right, good afternoon, MLive viewers. I'm Jonathan Osting. I'm here in our downtown Lansing hub with MLive managing producer Shannon Murphy and our special guest, Michigan Governor Rick Snyder. Governor, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to be with you again. All right. We are, uh, Governor, by my count, about 43 days out from the May 5 election, which is when voters are going to decide the fate of Michigan Roads Proposal 1. It's a statewide election, uh, a statewide ballot proposal that would raise the state sales tax mm -hmm. by 1%. It would exempt fuel and it would trigger trigger uh, a host of other laws, 10 of them in fact. Uh, absentee ballots are already available to some voters, uh, so we appreciate you being here mm -hmm. to discuss this proposal in more detail with people who maybe already are deciding whether to vote or who are preparing to do so in May. Um, Governor, let's, let's get right to it. Big picture, uh, why should voters support what is essentially going to be a nearly $2 billion tax increase? Yeah, well the primary reason is safer roads in Michigan. Um, we deserve them. We need them. Um, if you looked at it, the roads in Michigan are not in the shape they need to be um, so you can feel confident out there on the roads. And the illustrations I'll give you is if you're driving around and you look up and look underneath a bridge and you see plywood or the steel mesh, um, why is it there? It's to hold up concrete, pieces of concrete from potentially falling on your vehicle. Uh, that's scary. Um, in terms of driving on the road, if you hit a pothole, you're at risk. You're a distracted driver. You may not be in control of your vehicle. If you're swerving to miss a pothole, you're a distracted driver. Um, how many people do you know in the last year or two have either had a blown tire or a bent rim? That's a scary experience when that happens, let alone a costly experience. So let's do our roads right, and that's the primary reason for all of Proposal 1. There are a host of other things, but that's why I'm happy to do events like this, so we can talk through those so people can see they make sense. Sure. So what Proposal 1 is, is a package that is focused primarily on safer roads, but it's a package to strengthen Michigan and to have us be better off. And just to illustrate the point, I, I actually brought a couple things for each, one for each one of you, but uh, this is a piece of saying. either Michigan bridge or road that we were able to collect to show what the kind of danger okay. is. Um, so you're welcome, you each have a now piece of road, which <laughs> Normally, I know with press there's always concerns, but there is no value to this particular <laughs> it's item. It's not a gift. It's not a gift, and uh, it really illustrates the important point. Sure, Governor. In fact, um, I think it was uh, late last week in Dearborn you held up one of those and talked about the potential of a, a piece of rock flying off from a bridge, and you used the line, your life may be in jeopardy or something to yeah. that effect. Is it really that dire? I mean, are, 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 you know, people... Are, are people actually dying because of roads, or are you worried this is going to happen? Well, you could, and actually I think there's a TV commercial where a, a woman has a true life illustration of a piece of concrete that got kicked up off the road and went through her windshield. Mm -hmm. And if you have a piece of that hit your windshield, it's coming through and it's scary. Um, it doesn't happen on a regular event, but that's the point. Why should we wait where it could happen much more frequently? Let's solve the problem. So, Governor, taking a step back, yeah. Uh, Michigan already spends three billion a year on its infrastructure, so why are the roads so bad here? Well, since you go to the the, the three billion dollar number, that, that's kind of a good illustration. Um, let's compare us to Ohio. Um, Ohio spends a billion dollars more than we do, okay. and people notice the difference. I mean, how many people will tell you the story about when they cross the state line? You can tell when you're in Ohio versus Michigan, and. What we're doing is we've been underinvesting in our infrastructure in Michigan for a lot of years. So we've been doing band-aids, we've had stopgap things rather than making structural fixes like Ohio has. I don't like losing to Ohio on anything. Let's get a better infrastructure put in place so we can be successful. And that's what the $1.2 billion would do. So, Governor, I, I cover the legislature, so I've seen this debate over the last several years. But for, for people at home, it, what are the alternatives if Proposal 1 fails? Yeah, and I appreciate that, Jonathan. I've been calling for this for since 2012. Sure. And we finally managed to get something done at the end of the year. Was it uh, my first choice? Not necessarily, but this was good work by the legislature coming together to put something on the ballot because there isn't another option um, in terms of something that had strong enough support to get majority support. In fact, this got two-thirds support of both chambers. So if this doesn't happen, I view it as we're probably going back to minus, uh, square minus two. Um, because normally you'd say if this didn't pass, you'd go back to square one. Sure. But if you think about it, if the voters vote down a tax increase, what's the likelihood of having legislators even be more hesitant than they were before to vote for an increase? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think we actually probably go backwards. Sure. Doing nothing is the very worst answer, though. Doing nothing um, really creates this environment where you're just going to see more crumbling roads. And not only a safety issue, it's a cost issue. Um, if you let a road go from good to poor, and then you say, how much does it cost to keep it up to get it back to good status? It's five or six times as much to get a poor road up to good as opposed to keeping a good road good. So this bill is only going to go up dramatically, and our risk factors are only going dramatically to do nothing. Let's get this done. Sure. Relentless positive action. Let's go. <laughs> well, let me ask you about one specific alternative that the House has brought up, the so-called Bolger Plan. It was yeah. approved last year uh, by the House in a, a fairly narrow vote, but didn't see a vote in the Senate. And you were critical of it at the time. Lawmakers are bringing back that legislation mm -hmm. this year, saying it's possible to fix the roads without raising taxes. Is that a viable plan B? Well, let me start with the point that it's, it's interesting that it's coming back again in the House. Legislators are bringing it up. They're calling it the Bolger Plan. Jace Bolger is supporting Proposal 1. Sure. So I think that says a strong statement that I think we came to a good outcome. Um, if you looked at it, what the House plan really does is create a budget problem um, for schools and local government because it removes the sales tax from the pump, but it doesn't provide a path to solve that. Um, without looking at uh, existing revenue sources. And what I would say is, is I think we've done tremendously well at our budget process the last few years in terms of not just speed but the quality of budgeting and really looking at how to stretch, how to get the maximum amount of government um, so we can give our taxpayers the best value. And if you do the analysis over the last three years, we've been devoting some general fund dollars towards transportation. That was traditionally not done um, and not expected. But because of the nature of this kind of crisis, this challenge, we needed to do something. So roughly the numbers we've been able to find in our existing budget was somewhere between about $100 million um, up to $370 million or so. Those are significant resources, but they're not the $1.2 billion to solve this problem. Sure. So we don't want to leave a huge hole for other people or not fully solve the problem. Let's get a solution in place that works for the long term. Thanks. Governor, we're going to turn to our first reader question. Mm -hmm. And it's one we get a lot. Uh, this comes from the Rob Dale on Twitter. And they ask, why didn't legislators make it just for the roads? Why all the extra little stuff in there? Yeah, I wouldn't call it little stuff. I mean, these are significant um, investments that are being made. But this was part of um, getting a bipartisan package put together. This was Republicans and Democrats, the House and the Senate all coming together to say, here's a solution that solves the problem. At the same time, it helps actually restore some cuts we had to make in 2011. I had a big budget deficit, so I recommended some cuts that actually got made. But this helps restore things like revenue sharing, um, dollars for local government, um, the earned income tax credit. It's simply restoring what was in 2011. So it's really bringing us back some of the things we had to make cuts for during difficult years. The one area that does have additional dollars is really the school aid fund. But the school aid fund will then be available to actually not only help K-12, but help community colleges. And one area where we need to invest more is career tech education and the skilled trades. And this would provide more resources. And I'm already recommending significant new investments in the skilled trades with our regular budget. OK. Now we have a similar follow-up question from our friends at the Flint Journal. from the Flint Journal here. Uh, my question is, this is being sold as a roads proposal, but it would increase the sales tax, and none of that money actually goes to roads. So where does the state sales tax money go, and why is that increase a part of this proposal? Well, I appreciate that. And one of the things people say, this is very complex in a lot of ways, but what I would tell you is we're actually simplifying a really complex situation that helps answer your question. Because a lot of times when people go pay at the pump, they think that's all going to transportation. That's not true. And that, in fact, people typically get upset when they learn a good chunk of their dollars on the pump are not going to transportation. And why is that true? 19 cents a dollar on a flat amount is going to transportation today. The balance of your state tax revenue is the retail sales tax that we pay the 6% on other goods. It applies to gasoline today. What this would do is eliminate that, replace it all with essentially the 19 cents would go to 42 cents. Everything then goes to transportation at the pump, which is a simplifying answer, a better answer. 
The challenge then was, is when you essentially take off the retail sales tax from gas, we create a budget problem. And it goes to the question, where does our sales tax go? It goes to largely the school aid fund. There is revenue sharing for local government. There's a piece that goes to comprehensive transportation in terms of some resources for mass public transportation. And there is some general fund dollars. So how do we backfill that? And that's the need to go from 6 to 7 percent um, in terms of the retail sales tax. Um, that's also what the legislature had to do by a two-thirds vote. More than a majority vote, but a two-thirds vote of both chambers to put on the ballot. So they did step up to approve that. Sure. I think I heard you say, Governor, once it, uh, it, it's a complicated way of simplifying things. Yes. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> so you mentioned the school aid fund several mm -hmm. times. Um, but multiple analysis show that once fully implemented, it's impossible to predict how schools will be impacted with this. Uh, why should people who care about school funding mm -hmm. vote for Prop 1 when it might not provide any new funds for schools? Well, I'm not sure how it wouldn't provide new funds. I mean, this is a better, more stable um, source of revenue than doing it on fuels, in my view. If you think about the fluctuating p prices of gas over the last few years, it's been fairly volatile which in fact I've been concerned that could cause a problem in the school aid fund. Um, again, if you went from 350 per gallon to 250, that's a big drop in revenue right there. So if you look at the rest of the retail sales tax, that tends to be very stable, um, tends to grow at several percent a year. Um, and I think that's a better revenue source and I would see it generally adding revenue and I think most of the forecasts would. I'm not sure how you really analyze how it would go down without really assuming some major economic problems that would create a lot of other problems in our state. Okay. Um, also talking about the school aid fund, mm -hmm. um, proposal one would constitutionally eliminate higher education funding from yeah. the school aid fund but will continue to fund community college um, out of the school aid fund. Mm -hmm. Do you envision the school aid fund fully paying for community college if Prop 1 passes? Yeah, I think that's something that's very viable. I, again, if you move the university piece out and the community college piece in, um, generally it, it's, they're similar kind of numbers. Um, what I would say in some fashion for the amount that's been in each fund over the last few years. Again, the total budgets are dramatically different, but in how much has been in school aid versus general fund. So I think it's a good clarification um, because there's been a controversy for a number of years. Um, ever since proposal um, A, if you go back in time, a number of people have contended that the school aid fund is only for K-12. Um, the Constitution of the state of Michigan makes it absolutely clear. There's no ambiguity to it. It's for universities, community colleges, and K-12. Um, but there's been this controversy for all these years. This would actually clarify it, get an answer to that, which I think is a good answer. It would go to K-12, um, community colleges, also, career tech education and scholarships, and is still available to help pay um, retirement debt. Okay. Um, we're going to turn to another reader question. Mm -hmm. This one is from Larry Quakular. Uh, besides the obvious increase for the sales tax, what kind of increase will be expected on the vehicle registrations tax and the increase on the gasoline tax? Sure, I'll take the gasoline tax piece first because I've talked about that a little bit already. So it's 19 cents a gallon flat right now, plus the retail sales tax. So it depends on the price of gas. Um, but if you look at the proposal, this would essentially take it up to a wholesale tax, but the equivalent would be about 42 cents a gallon. And that would increase by cost of living. So in terms of increase, it's a few cents increase over what we're paying today. Um, it's very similar if you use the average price of gas last year. Um, in terms of registration fee, we're not talking about actually increasing registration fees from the time you buy the vehicle. What we're talking about is eliminating the ramp down. And many people, I've asked people, did you know you, when you pay your registration fee that after year one it actually ratchets down for the next three years? Ask that of hundreds of people and no one, almost no one in the entire audience knew that. So what we're suggesting is let's get rid of the ramp down. So we actually wouldn't increase it more than what you're paying today when you pay that first year, but you wouldn't have the benefit of it ramping down. Governor, going back to the fuel taxes, you mentioned that the, mm -hmm. the amount of sales tax really depends on the price of gasoline because gas is low right now. Yeah. Wouldn't the day one increase potentially be as much as 10 cents uh, per gallon for Michigan Motors? Yeah, if it's at the lower end. Again, if you're getting down to $2 gas or something, again, it depends on gas prices. Sure, gotcha. Um, let's go to another reader question from Facebook. This one's from Dana Remizovsky. 
Uh, she says, uh, Governor, who will be overseeing this new money to make sure that it goes to repairing roads? Also, how much of it is actually going to go to fund road repairs? Yeah, if you looked at it in terms of everything at the pump, the transportation piece will all go to roads and bridges and uh, the maintenance and repair of those. That's clear. The part in terms of who oversees it, that's a responsibility of my responsibility and the legislature. Um, to look at these, again, managing the Michigan Department of Transportation. And then a fair chunk of these resources go to local governments and to the counties. So county road commissions, um, quite often in the counties you're in, or the local officials in your community, the city, town, or village. Um, so it depends on the level of government, because there's a funding formula where it goes in the top and it gets divided roughly about close to 40% for the state, about 40% for the counties, and about 20% to cities, towns, and villages. Sure. Um, and each group is responsible for using those funds. To make you feel better about how those funds get used, though, there's several statutes in this package that talk about increasing more warranties. Um, warranties will be required on projects over a million dollars, more competitive building on projects over $100,000, and preventive maintenance plans being required of the state and our largest counties. So there's a whole series of things to improve practices, make sure they are strengthened statewide. Uh, Governor, in the past few months, the State Auditor General has released a series of audits that were critical of the Michigan Department of Transportation's oversight of rail car procurement and also road construction warranty follow through. Why should voters trust that new money for roads is actually going to end up fixing the roads? Yeah, well again, uh, the rail car situation goes back to a unique case that was before I became governor that goes back to trying to get commuter rail in Michigan. And the federal government changed their practices, which has delayed the project. So that's been a challenge. On the, the warranties piece, actually we should be proud. Michigan has more road warranties already than any other state to get contractors to pay for their issues. And the issue we found is we are leading in terms of doing more warranties. Um, so most of the warranty work went well, but there was a handful where we needed some learning experience because we're new at that in terms of administering warranties. And the good part is, is through the audit process, we've learned that there are some enhancements that we can have to make sure as we get the statute passed, we're going to be in great shape to make sure everything gets applied the right way. Thank you. We're going to go to another video question. Sure. This one's from the Grand Rapids Press. This is like the Daily Double in Jeopardy, <laughs> the video. <laughs> Governor, hey, I'm Matt Vandabunny, a reporter with M Live in the Grand Rapids Press. My community just passed a local tax for roads, and others across the state are doing the same thing. So why now should I also vote for a new state tax for roads? And if this ballot proposal passes in May, how do you justify me and others across the state getting double dipped on road taxes? Well, if you look at it, I think we need a, a fair amount of infrastructure investment. And what happens with the, the dollars coming to the state? Part of that does get disseminated to the state, to the counties, and towns and villages, as I said, and cities like Grand Rapids. Um, the real question is, is I think you probably find you have a lot of infrastructure needs with your city and local roads. And the question you should ask of the community is, is do you want to continue that? Do you want to look at variations if we get more resources for that local jurisdiction? That's a fair question to ask, but again, that can be done through the local legislative process or the ballot process in your own community. We're going to go to a related qu video mm -hmm. question from the Muskegon Chronicle. Hey, Governor, it's Steve Klosterman at the Muskegon County Road Commission. Last month, Muskegon County residents voted down a local roads millage, two no votes to every one yes vote. If Proposal 1 fails, are there ways to fix roads without new taxes? Thanks. If this doesn't pass, we're going to continue on a very negative path of having worse roads in Michigan. That's why it's important it does pass. Um, as If you look at the challenges, um, it would be very difficult to get something done legislatively, in my view, if this does not pass. So let's get this going. One thing I think that makes me feel good that there's strong support for this is the Safe Roads Yes Coalition. Um, and they have a great website, saferoadsyes.com actually has over 100 different coalition members now. And these are large organizations, business organizations, including the Small Business Association of Michigan, a lot of chambers, to a lot of labor organizations. It's great. We've got the AFL-CIO, the operating engineers, the laborers, all these different groups that are supporting it. And it shows when Michiganders work together, we can do tremendous things. And this coalition's fabulous in terms of their breadth and depth. Thanks, Governor. Um, we're going to go to a quick reader question here from Greg. 
who asks, uh, how long until the roads actually see the money? My understanding is it's up to three years. Well, this would take effect, parts of it take effect um, October 1. Mm -hmm. So it's fairly short term in terms of that. Some of the initial couple of years money will use to pay down debt, which I agree with. Um, a lot of people don't realize that back in the early 2000s, um, 2003, 2004, the state borrowed over a billion dollars um, to do road repairs, so, which is actually kind of glossed over this issue. It helped hide it even more. And we've got about $100 million of debt service going out today. So we're $100 million short. When you see that number coming into the state for road repairs, $100 million is going to pay down that debt right now. So by repaying that debt, that frees up more money to actually go to the roads, which is a good answer. But what I would say is if this gets passed, we would work on financing, using financing tools to accelerate the resources coming in. We can use some financing tools because I'd like to see more road projects this summer. So I assume we're going to get a positive vote on May 5th. I want to see, we've got some projects May 6th to start talking about, let's get them going in addition to our normal road work. So you're talking about additional bonding? I mean, we'd be well, paying again, off I wouldn't old use, bonding. I wouldn't necessarily use the term bonding because, again, I don't think for a two- or three-year acceleration, you don't need to go sell a 10- or 20-year bond, okay. and I'd like to get rid of those. Sure, sure. Um, Governor, the Citizens Research Council uh, last week highlighted what appears to be a drafting error with one of the road funding bills linked mm -hmm. to Proposal 1. As it stands, it sounds like the bill would actually cap total road spending um, rather than just road spending. Uh, the new road money in years one or two yeah. while that debt is paid down. Is that something the legislature is going to have to fix? Yeah, most likely. Again, we're still reviewing that particular piece, but there's probably two or three other things also. So there's a list of certain things. This is not unusual when you have a big legislative package that you end up, call it trailer bills quite often, some cleanup bills to be part of this process. So I would say that's just part of the normal legislative process. Sure. That would happen fairly quickly and efficiently. Okay. Well, a related question here um, that I got via email from a reader uh, named Wendy Horde. Um, she says, if uh, Proposal 1 kicks in 10 laws, what happens when lawmakers want to revise those laws? Can the legislature simply revise these, or will it require a vote of the people, as uh, the proposal itself will require? Yeah, it depends on what particular piece we're talking about. Some of these will... Again, the reason for the ballot initiative is, is a constitutional change to change the sales tax rate from 6 to 7. Also, there's language on what can happen with the money with respect to the retail sales tax, about how much goes to schools, local government, and then what the school aid fund piece is. Those are all, all would be constitutionally protected that the legislature simply couldn't change. With respect to the bulk of the pieces, the legislature could change them. But some of these I view as good long-term answers because politically it would be extremely difficult uh, to change some of the positions on a number of these things. For example, the concept that all the money at the pumps going to transportation, I think that's a strong point that I would find it very difficult for a legislature to change how that's being handled. Sure. I've heard um, some on the Safe Roads Yes campaign so that say, though, this would guarantee money for roads. As you mentioned, I mean, that is subject to, to lawmakers um, n not changing yeah. these bills. But I think that's, again, I might use a different word, but I, again, it would be extremely difficult politically to change. Sure. All right. Uh, we're going to shoot it. Uh, sorry, actually. Uh, sorry. Go ahead, Shannon. <laughs> Fine. Um, proposal 1 would generate new money for state and local road agencies. So we've got a question about that topic from the Saginaw okay. News. I'm here at Wicks Park Drive, a street which Saginaw recently closed due to deteriorating road conditions. With about 80% of Saginaw's city streets rated in poor condition, city engineers estimate it would cost about $271 million to repair them all. According to the House Fiscal Agency, Proposal 1 if passed, would generate about $3 million more for Saginaw's road budget annually in the third year it's implemented. Given the disparity between these two numbers, does the proposal go far enough to help cities like Saginaw address local roads like this? Well, I can see that road. There's some huge potholes there <laughs> behind that. And again, if you go to any particular community, some will be in great shape, some may have more challenges. Um, this gets us on the path of making major improvements, though, because when you talk about a community and you see the roads in a community, quite often it's confusing for people because there's a combination. There'll be state roads, there'll be county roads, and there'll be local roads all within the same borders. 
And so you'll hopefully see improvement, particularly on state and county roads with the resources, but also city roads. But as we saw the case of Grand Rapids, there still may be a desire to have some local additional dollars if it involves the local streets in front of your home, because those typically would be city or town roads. Sure. Governor, you've been talking for a long time now about uh, $1.2 billion mm -hmm. for roads. Um, I was talking to uh, former state rep Rick Olson last week. He said the need is closer to $2.5 billion. Um, How did you arrive at that $1.2 number? Well, this is to help keep us at good and fair. I mean, are we going to get great roads in Michigan? This doesn't get us to great roads because that becomes extremely expensive. But this keeps us on a path to really turn around that pattern we're on to go from good to poor, much like the road we just saw in Saginaw. So how do we stabilize the road system? How do we improve it and keep it structurally sound? I mean, we have a fundamental issue. We're a northern state that has a strong freeze-thaw cycle. So we're at a disadvantage compared to other states, but $1.2 billion really does make a dramatic improvement in our roads and makes them something that you'll feel safer on. Sure. All right, well, I didn't mean to steal her thunder, but we have a related question here from Danielle Salisbury. Um, oh, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> um, from Danielle Salisbury uh, at the Jackson Citizen Patriot. Even supporters of this proposal say it doesn't raise enough funds to fix all the streets that need it in Michigan. So what, if anything else, could be proposed in the future? Well, I think we just talked about a lot of that, Jonathan, that this makes a major improvement. Um, are there always going to be ways we can incrementally improve? Again, local communities may make some local decisions, but I think we're on a path for, again, a much safer network of roads where hopefully we can say we're getting rid of plywood, you don't have to look up all the time, and those major potholes are gone. Sure. Um, Governor, you just mentioned some of the unique uh, weather conditions we have here um, in Michigan, but of course some other Midwest states have similar conditions and, and do seem to have better roads. Here's a question on that topic from an MLive commenter. Um, KMAC 34 ask, is it even possible to make a road essentially indestructible, which would be awesome, and how does this proposal address just making roads better to begin with? Yeah, again, uh, you can probably make anything indestructible at how much cost in relationship to how much road we have to cover. So I think we need to make a smart balance there. That's where the warranty, the bidding, all these preventive maintenance practices are really important to go with this. So that improves it. But we're also looking at innovation. One illustration people don't recognize is Michigan is actually a leader in innovating in materials and ideas um, to make better roads and bridges. One thing I'm really proud of is we're, I think we're leading the country in carbon fiber bridges. Um, we've got three of them done now, which basically replaces the steel rebar um, with carbon fiber. And if you look at one of the reasons these bridges are deteriorating, the steel is you know, rusting out at some point in time. So it costs more for carbon fiber today but it saves you a lot of money over the life of the project because it puts off the time you have to do the redecking. You can use much less concrete to begin with. So that's the kind of thing that with these extra resources, we can really look to say, can we get out of this cycle in some ways? It wouldn't make it indestructible, but it makes it a whole lot lower maintenance over the life cycle of that bridge. Sure. Thanks. So we have one more video from our friends at the Bay City Times. Hi, Governor. This is Andrew Dotson with the Bay City Times. State Senator Mike Green last year introduced a bill that would see the state pick up maintenance costs for four, two of Bay City's four bascule bridges. The bill expired last year, but Green said he plans to see it through and is going to introduce it re, uh, later this year. He said the success of that bill hinges on voters approving the comprehensive road bill this May. If it passes, Bay City could have more than a half a million dollars annually to put toward its local streets. My question for you is, would you be in favor of a bill that would help cover the costs of uh, the maintenance of these bridges like the one behind me, knowing that you could help a community like Bay City put that much money towards its crumbling roads? Well, I appreciate that, and I appreciate Bay City having a strong interest in getting additional resources. Um, what I would say is I don't take positions on particular legislation until they get farther in the process. So that's something I'm happy to look at. Um, I just need to be sensitive that a lot of communities have bridges and we need to be fair about allocating those resources. Okay. We have about 15 minutes left, um, so mm -hmm. we're going to try to get to as many reader questions as sure. we can in that time. Um, so we have one from a uh, reader from Thomas Patterson. It says, where, where is all the money from the lottery, pension taxes, and all the money in the past gone? 
Sure. Well, that's a broad question. I'll, <laughs> I'll take a part where's of that because it'd be, where'd all the money go? <laughs> uh, the lotto money primarily goes to the school aid fund. Um, so that's where it's gone traditionally, and it's a significant amount of money. Uh, in terms of the, the, the term pension tax, actually, that was a, a benefit people got that now we're not taxing seniors that are working. So if you looked at it, that was back to 2011 when we had a significant deficit. So we balanced the budget, and the good part is, is we're coming back strong in terms of the economy in Michigan. So we're seeing good increases in revenue, and that's something that I'm proud of the, the future of our state. All right, Governor, another reader question here from Jin Sangati, I believe it's pronounced. Um, how much is in the rainy day fund? If it's not used when we have dangerous roads, you suggested life-threatening situations the other day, then please give us an example of how it ever would be used. Sure, the rainy day fund, to give you an item, was when I took office, they had about $2 million in it. And we've been able to build that back to roughly a half a billion dollars or so. Um, our goal should be to get it over a billion dollars if you look at good financial practice, so we're still uh, quite a bit off the mark. And the way to think about it, think about when you see the budget recommendations for your family budget. They suggest you should have about six months you know, earnings set aside in a savings account. So that's roughly what we're trying to do with the state government in many respects, even a smaller percentage, I would say. Um, the issue with using the rainy day fund for something like this, it's one-time money. So it's like drawing out of your savings account. It's not recurring money. Where the $1.2 billion is like income, where it comes every year and you can continue to invest. So using rainy day fund would only be a short-term band-aid. It wouldn't fundamentally solve this problem anyway. Um, to give you an illustration, when it did get used, we actually drew on some of it for the Detroit bankruptcy settlement, for the grand bargain. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, another reader question here, C. Grantsky. Um, what will the increased sales tax likely do to in-state sales, especially in border areas where people could go to Ohio where the sales tax might be lower? Are you concerned people might jump across the border to buy a car or something like that? Yeah, we don't foresee a lot of that because if you look at it, we're roughly com we would roughly be comparable with some of the surrounding states. Um, Michigan, it tends to, tended to be at the lower end at 6%. 7% puts us like right in the middle of the pack. We'd be in the 20s if you compare both state and local sales tax. Because one of the things you have to look at is many states have local sales taxes that add to your burden. And that can be a huge number. If you go to a Chicago or New York, you're paying a lot in sales tax. I hope you look at that receipt sometime and make sure you do your shopping back here in Michigan. We're a good deal. Sure. Yeah, I've been researching that a little bit lately, actually. Um, you know, a 7% sales tax would put Michigan towards the top of the state, just top of the nation in terms of just that sales tax. But as you mentioned, that local option can uh, can actually add up. Uh, yeah, we'd still be in the 20s the state of the states as a whole. If you add state and local together. Gotcha. Sure. So another reader question, this one comes from MSU Nicknell, um, and they ask, uh, why isn't the governor repealing his $1.8 billion a year in business tax breaks to pay for the road repairs on the table? The tax breaks have generated neither the well-paying jobs nor the overall economic growth promised. Instead, he wants working families who have already seen their taxes raised repeatedly to pay even more. Well, sure, I'm happy to answer that because we were we had the worst tax in the country. The Michigan business tax was a job killer. It literally drove people to leave Michigan. Um, the state of Indiana, if you went down to Indiana, their best economic development tool was the Michigan business tax. That wasn't a good answer at all. So we wiped it out. We replaced it with a simple, fair, and efficient tax. And to give you an idea of magnitude when they talk about it being so low, the tax rate on our corporate income tax is 6%. Our individual rate is 4 and a quarter. So actually, we have a higher tax rate on our companies, our corporations, than we do on individuals. So again, this was to make us competitive, and it has resulted in a lot of jobs. Again, with a lot of other factors. It's not just that, but if you combine all the features, the job creation in Michigan over the last few years, it's nearly 400,000 private sector jobs, 382,000. Um, our unemployment rate is the lowest since 2002. So we've had a strong resurgence in terms of job creation with creating a much better environment to do business in Michigan being a key part of that. Governor, to the to the larger issue, though, I've gotten mm -hmm. questions from other readers, you know, wondering, are businesses paying their fair share yeah. of this roads fix? How would this uh, impact uh, businesses, uh, and how would they help um, solve this problem? Well, sure. One of the things is, is if you think about the pump piece, in terms of everything at the pump, um, we're going to include diesel parity as part of this. Mm -hmm. So if anyone in a business is out there running trucks, doing all that, they're paying 
Um, there are some exclusions for certain kind of business activities, but largely they're paying at the pump for transportation, so they're paying their fair share. We're talking about increasing um, registration fees on heavier trucks by a significant amount, because that's a criticism we hear from quite a few people. So there is a piece to increase registration fee costs for big trucks. And then if you think about it in terms of the retail sales tax, um, other than certain exclusions, sale for resale and things like that, um, if businesses are out buying goods, they're paying retail sales tax also. So they're participating in this um, in a you know, way that might surprise people. Sure. Um, you mentioned the um, higher fees for, for large mm -hmm. trucks. Another issue that comes up uh, every yeah. time I write a story on this is why do we have the highest um, truck weight limits in the country yeah. and isn't that uh, causing damage to our roads that we should address? Yeah, it's a question that gets asked a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but to put it in context, the real question is it's not necessarily the weight of the truck but the weight per axle. So what we've done in Michigan is require many more axles because what that does is distribute the weight more evenly across the, the pavement in some fashion. And there's a lot of research to say that's the best way to address the issue. Again, there is controversy on both of this, but mm -hmm. actually doing it by axle is a good way in terms of a system because you have to ask yourself the question, if you didn't have the heavier truck with the weight being distributed, you just end up with two trucks. Mm -hmm. So you're a header behind. Um, and it looks like we've got a good practice going in Michigan. Again, part of that though was to say, let's increase registration fees. To give you an idea of magnitude, because I'll hear people say, well, why don't you increase them a whole lot? We have significant increases, but that total amount's about $50 million. Um, that's not $1.2 billion. Sure. If we tried to raise $1.2 billion on our trucks in terms of registration fees or something like that, we wouldn't have any trucks on the road to bring us any goods in the state of Michigan. Sure, Michigan being a peninsula, of course, trucks don't necessarily have to yeah. drive through here. Um, uh, skipping ahead, I'm going to skip one, Fritz, if you're following along. Um, another reader question from Steve Perry. Um, you mentioned this state a little bit before, but why don't we mimic Ohio and talk about uh, talk to them about how they keep their roads so nice? Mm -hmm. um, uh, remember, he points out, if we raise the sales tax, that's going to remain at that level. We're never going to get it lower. Um, can we at least talk about providing 1% for maybe five or six years to fix roads and then bring it back down? So a few questions there. Sure. Again, this would go from six to seven. To be open, there's no requirement that says it has to stay there. And people can ask that question. It's just like changing any tax rate. It is allowed constitutionally. That's the maximum. Sure. There would have to be another the vote Legislatively, the no, legislatively, well, you could bring down the rate. Okay. Do you see that happening? Uh, well, again, uh, I think, let me put it this way, that I think we have a significant number of years that we need to make an investment. Um, but again, that's not to say it couldn't be reconsidered somewhere in the, the farther out future. But again, if you look at, as we were talking about, we need a significant investment for a number of years here. Mm -hmm. Sure. Jen? Um, so we'll go back to a reader question from Larry. Um, You've mentioned several times that the roads are that bad and jeopardizing our lives, potentially. Mm -hmm. So if, if that's true and they're so bad, why is road funding being put on this layaway plan while everything else in the state is addressed first? Well, again, this is where paying down the debt actually gives us more resources longer term to improve our roads. And that's where I talked about I'd like to look at accelerating projects. So let's bring in more projects. Let's do more than what we'd otherwise do without this um, even starting the summer. Governor, um, a reader, uh, F. Liver 316, um, asks whether um, an income tax increase was ever considered as opposed to a sales tax. I know Democrats have also talked about the idea of a graduated income tax. Any thoughts to, uh, to those sort of solutions to raise money for roads? Yeah, there was only a limited discussion on that because, again, a graduated income tax is another constitutional issue. Our Constitution requires that be a proportional one, not a graduated income tax. And then if you look at where the burden would come, I think people felt better because of, again, we were creating a problem by taking the retail sales tax off of gas. So the hole that needed to be solved were the people receiving that fund. The easiest way to solve that was simply to say, let's go from six to seven. Sure. Um, and then one final reader question. This is the last one we got for you. It's kind of a long one. Uh, MI Ottawa says, I live in Ottawa County and we just passed a millage to improve the roads. Does this mean Ottawa County won't be benefiting from this proposal if it passes? If it will benefit, then how um, is there overlap? Yeah, this is much like the question from Grand Rapids, and I appreciate it. So to the degree um, 
it, they don't necessarily overlap. They will add value. So you'll get better roads in Ottawa County because of that millage. Um, you'll get additional resources from Proposal 1. So what I would say is, is you've got extra resources, not extra resources in terms of dollars not needed, but you can do even more road work or transportation work. And that would be a local question to say, do you want to keep that millage going if you're getting extra resources from the state funding formula? Sure. So it's sort of a nesting effect, yeah. if you will. Gotcha. All right. Well, um, Governor, that's, that's all the questions we have lined up for you today. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, for the viewers at home, um, definitely check out MLive.com. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll be breaking down uh, Proposal 1 uh, with a series of in-depth stories, um, and you can find those all at uh, MLive.com. Thank you. Great. Great, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.